Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Open Research Institute FPGA stand-up for the 14th of March, 2023. We have some updates. We are going to move forward with uh, purchasing an ADRV 9002-9002 development board to go with the ZCU 106. This will expand our capabilities for FPGA and RF SOC work in remote labs. And this particular chip, uh, the 9002, has been requested from a couple of different people. The particular project that needs it to be purchased is Neptune. We'll be talking more about that in the near future. It's a OFDM uh, based project that is in the drone category and has an open protocol that will be published shortly. And uh, some some interesting challenges in terms of design and, and form factor. So this particular uh, board, the ADRV 9002, it comes in two variants. So it's not like the ADRV 9371, which we currently have working with the ZC706 Xilinx uh, baseboard. Um, in, in the case of the 9002, we need to decide between a 300 megahertz to 3 gigahertz version or a 3 gigahertz to 6 gigahertz version. Those are two different boards. So one way to do this would be to buy one version for one lab for Remote South, and buy another version for another lab, for example, Remote West, or any other lab that would like to be established that has a um, FPGA board to attach it to. So we'll be purchasing this as soon as we can kind of figure out a game plan on on the frequencies. I've, I've asked Leonard, who's uh, leading Neptune, which one he prefers, and we'll at least get that. So in terms of expanding the capabilities of our remote labs, that's the latest news on that. Um, we have a ZCU-106 in both Remote Lab West and Remote Lab South, and they're they're used, but not um, not used to their fullest potential, I would say. So this will this will go a long way to to giving us capability and uh, some some published work with the Ultra Scale Plus uh, variant of the of FPGAs from Xilinx. Our uh, our floating license for Vada, Vada will handle this no problem. And the remaining factors are people and time and and projects that need the support. So that's the major uh, update from from this end. Uh, there's there's other updates about training. We've been talking about putting together a custom MathWorks class for for us, and that's moving forward. It looks like we're going to go ahead and choose the remote. Uh, version rather than try to get it to be an in-person class. The closest in-person site uh, for, for us uh, looks like Los Angeles. And I think it'd be a pretty tough go to try to get people to Los Angeles for an in-person multi-day class. They also offer them remote. So we're going to go ahead and, uh, and say, yes, MathWorks, we would like for an SDR, FPGA, um, HDL coder class to train us up to fully utilize the things that we have in the labs. Um, and this this covers both remote lab south and remote lab west. Um, the, the, the machinery would be something that uh, we could better uh, fully use. Um, so we'll go ahead and, and, and press forward with a remote class and, and try to schedule that as soon as possible. All right, that's the the big updates there. Um, I don't have anything else in any other in any other categories. So I, but I do know that we have a lot of uplink work going on for the transponder. So I'll I'll turn it over to to Paul to talk about that. Okay. Um, before I talk about that, I have a couple of follow up items on the. Uh, the 9002 board, if that's okay. Of course, go ahead. Um, one thing that worries me a little bit about that is that the, uh, the ADRV 9001 eval board 
does not officially support the ZCU 106. Um, it has a list of compatible eval platforms of two, um, and that one's not one of them. So how confident are we that, that we can make it work on that board? The, yeah, it's a very good question. The, the ADRV 9002 is a uh, combination that shows up over and over again on engineer zone and is supported by, by analog devices. So when you navigate through and, and if you, if we wanted to set it up the same way that we did with the ZC 706 and the 9371, we would navigate through the, um, the HDL reference design and then compile that particular reference design. However, we can also support this directly through through MATLAB and Simulink and develop HDL code that way. So the combination of the ZCU 106 and the ADRV 9002 uh, appears and 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 is a viable uh, support option for for development. And it's the the 9002 was specifically identified by um, Sasha and Leonard both as like, can we really get this up and running in the lab? So if there is anything that we need to do to, to kind of fill in the gaps uh, for the for the ZCU 100 series, which includes the 102, 104, 106, so we have the 106, um, then then I'm game to, to do it. Uh, so so that's, that's the answer. It, it is a viable combination. It looks like it's supported uh, there's there's answers on the engineer zone where they they don't say hey that's not a supported combination they just simply go ahead and answer the the problems and and of course you know, like any other development platform we will have problems okay um, another thing that confuses me about this is that they seem to have changed their naming convention um, before. The ADRV prefix meant the dev board, and it looks like now it means the device. And they use an eval ADRV nine thousand two uh, description for the for the dev board with the connectors and stuff on it. I that's going to confuse me for for the rest of time. I think, but <laughs> as long yeah, as we're, as long as we're writing ordering the right. Thing. Right, right. As long as we get a board and not a part, then I'll be happy. Yeah, ADRV stands for Analog Devices Radioverse, sort of like universe, but radio. And it's a it's a marketing term that has morphed over time. So, yeah, there some of the ADRV line appears to be uh, a module, just the module itself, um, and then some of it appears to be the the boards that we're more familiar with, which are cards that plug into a baseboard with the supporting uh, FPGA. Okay. I'm looking at, right now, I'm looking at a picture of what a, I guess is the eval-ADRV 9002. And it doesn't have that big high-density connector that we use to connect to the the Xilinx board. So I'm a little confused about that. Yeah, it should. I've got, um, I've got a couple of listings from like, um, from, from DigiKey and, and Mauser that I've been looking at. Okay. So we'll, we'll narrow it down. We're not going to just order anything willy nilly, but uh, we're going to move forward with this particular family. There's the 9002, there's a 9004, or sorry, 9002 and three and four. Um, and it looks like those variants are just like the numbers of transmitters and receivers to me. But we'll, um, we'll, we'll review the, the actual uh, order uh, pretty carefully. We're going to go ahead and move to the next generation of of radio chips for the for the drone project. Okay. Oh, I, I see. The picture of the back makes it clear it does have that connector. I was expecting it to be a through hole connector because it has so many. I uh, but anyway, I was and I was wrong. It's a surface mount connector and it's mounted on the back of the board, so that makes sense. 
All right. Um, hopefully somebody will be around to tell me how to hook this thing up to get it installed in this remote lab because without a walkthrough from analog devices, I'll be over my head. Yeah, the, what I expect is that it will show up in a box and we open the box, turn off the ZCU 106, plug it into the correct connector, power it up, and we have a radio card um, in a parallel fashion to the to the ZC 706 and ADRV 9371. So that's what I'm expecting to see. And that's what it looks like it will be to me. And if it, if anything looks weird along the way, or if we have any deal breakers, then then we will find something else. We'll we'll go we'll we'll move to an, another radio card. The the basic idea here is that the the drone drone people and uh, and some of our transponder people would really like to see the ultra scale plus uh, be in the mix. Like we need to look at that and support ultra scale plus rather than stopping with the seven thousand series which is on the ZC706, which is an older family. It's still supported, um, but the Ultra Scale Plus is, is pretty darn cool. And that's that's where some interest is. Uh, so, that, so that's kind of the context of why we would want to go ahead and, and get a radio card for the, for the Ultra Scale Plus board. Okay. Well, if the procedure is as you describe, I think we can probably handle that. Yeah, yeah, I don't want us to bite off anything that we can't chew or that isn't something that that we can support. Um I'm willing to do like some glue logic and some 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 extra extra work or if there's some some files that have to be written, that's fine, you know, but but anything way out of the ballpark, I uh, don't want to do. And so far this looks like it's uh it's well within our abilities to to support and would give us some some greatly expanded capabilities the ultra scale plus is pretty pretty amazing so be a good thing okay um moving on to other uh, remote lab stuff um the pluto is once again connected so if anybody is working on pluto stuff they can resume remote operation I reconnected the one that has the uh, JTAG adapter on it on Karapi. Uh, it's not connected to the spectrum analyzer at the moment because the spectrum analyzer has been in doing useful duty on other projects, uh, but it can be connected to the spectrum analyzer on request if anybody is ready to, to do that kind of a test. So just let me know. And on the subject of uplink work, there has been some, um, making incremental progress toward having a, an uplink capability. The, uh, the primary focus at the moment of active development is on incorporating the protocol layers uh, because the protocol layers will have a fairly significant impact on the uh, numerology. Uh, once we have the protocol layers uh, at least dummied in, and running at the official uh, final, we hope, uh, frame rates, then a lot of other stuff can get put in place without planning on changing it again later. Um, so I'm taking a little a bit of a sidetrack to update the C++ uh, baseline code to, to work with the, the new numerology. And... Uh, because C++ is not my favorite language. This is going a little slower than it might and uh, slowing me down with some uh, some head scratching. But it'll make progress and we'll have that working for too much longer, I hope. Um, changing the frame rate also involves changing a bunch of other things like changing the interleaver, changing the, um, uh, the randomizer, change, maybe even changing the, uh, the coding scheme. And Michelle has been very helpful in in giving me new parameters and new uh, new designs for those things. And there's still work left to be done in that area. So I think that covers what what's new on that front. If I missed something, you wanted me to cover? No, that's all good. Um, we're we're hoping to get this design into 
into the FPGA or into FPGA code as well. And, and that, that leads to um, our upcoming like classes and, and training from MathWorks in order to leverage the, the tools that we have available to us uh, through, through MATLAB and Simulink. So we, we started on a, uh, a model for the uplink that's in, in MATLAB and, and Simulink and in, sort of in concert and in combination with the with the modulator and demodulator code that's in C++ that allows us to demonstrate the stuff over the air in, in hardware. We'll also have uh, a model that can then get turned into, into FPGA code and that can be part of our uh, published work for FPGA, um, you know, and so all of that kind of, kind of relies pretty heavily on some, some, very interesting tools uh, and and uh, and toolboxes from from MATLAB. So there'll be more about that pretty soon. So far, so good. We've we've we have some outstanding questions questions that that we don't have the answers to yet. Um, and there's there's just a lot of a uh, lot of really neat work going on to try to answer them and to to narrow down uh, some of these specifications and. Uh, you know things like coefficients and and filters and and interleaver polynomials and and all of that so it's been uh, progressing pretty well oh and one other thing i want to mention um maybe you covered this before i got my audio working here um the question of whether to get the lower frequency or higher frequency version of the radio um either oh, yeah. Will work. yeah that's a good question for for, for folks that that may not know the ADRV 9002, the dev board, it comes in, it's the dev board that we have with the 9371 is full coverage. So it's a wide band um, and it co goes, I think from 300 megahertz up to six gigahertz. So the 9002 doesn't, it covers 300 megahertz up to three gigahertz. And then there's another board, you buy a separate one if you want three gig to six gig. Yeah, so I have to decide it at purchase time. Um, my inclination is that the lower frequency one is likely to be more versatile for the kinds of things we need, unless we ac actually need to be emitting RF up at gigahertz. Um, just because we, there's more test equipment that works with it, there's uh, you know more we have more capability you know, at lower frequencies than we do at the higher ones. So if I we had no, no other reason to decide. I would argue for the lower frequency one. Okay. Yeah, that's smart. Um, okay. I've got that written down. I'm gonna. I've. I've got a. I've got a email out to to both Leonard for the, for Project Neptune and for uh, out to Sasha for transponder work um, as to what they prefer. So since since these dev boards are are helping us at essentially at baseband, it almost doesn't really matter. I mean, it's great to have uh, microwave capable, like the three gig to six gig is good. And it would, it would let us do things at our nominal um, uplink frequency of, of five gigahertz. But most of this work that we're doing is baseband anyway, and, and having the 300 megahertz to three gigahertz version wouldn't be a disaster. Uh, so I'll, so I'll, I'll wait until I hear back from the uh, teams that want to use this gear and then we'll go ahead and get whatever. And like I said, I mean, we could get one of each and put one at each lab, depending on what the labs want to do. You know, that would be if we had more money than, than time. Um, so I think, I think we'll, we'll, we'll take a measured approach and we'll listen to what everybody says. And, and I think the advice that, uh, that we go for the lower, frequency band is is good and it 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 does make a difference to be able for people to be able to work with the frequencies if, if money didn't matter at all we can buy, buy both radios for both labs yeah <laughs> yes we could <laughs> it, it, it is nice to have the same thing in both places though so you can reproduce results without having to change parameters. Yeah. yeah okay well we'll do the smartest thing that we possibly can with the with the expansion, the lab expansion, and and uh, and get this done. The the protocol is really neat. It's called FlexLink, and the physical layer protocol document will be released 
first. Um, it's, I would say done at this point, the data link layer for the flex link is not, not really done yet. There's some, some questions on going from physical layer to data link layer, uh, that, that are kind of specific to the drone world and, and, you know, so, so my recommendation to, to them was to just go ahead and release the physical layer open source protocol document so that they can get feedback immediately and so that we could start working on it. So it's it's definitely OFDM. It's definitely leveraged pretty hard from LTE. It's got a lot of lot in common and and a lot of it will look familiar. Uh, but it has some some truly you know so streamlined and elegant um, you know advancements. The the primary author has a whole lot of experience in digital communications and is a pro. Works at Roden Schwartz and has written a couple of textbooks. So. I'm extremely happy that we have something like this in our community and that we can we get we're going to get the chance to support it and to to do an implementation and possibly a board. So it's a big opportunity for us and and um so whatever the right board to get in the short term we'll go ahead and get and then um look forward to delivering a really nice uh thing that will help aerospace and and drones. Yeah, and I can't really think of anything else on the uplink. I published a, a little a short essay on the interleaver selection and the fact that randomization is a factor uh, that we learned about, about that. Um, I think, though, for a single convolutional code for our uplink, that we're, if, as long as we pick the, the biggest spread, uh, you know, the largest minimum interleaver distance for that particular set of coefficients that we're going to be... Um, that'll be the ideal thing that 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 will be be good and the coefficients that we have are are literally the theoretical maximum for the for that particular frame length so uh you know as long as as that as maximizing that particular statistic is is all that we need to do since we're not a turbo code we're not using turbo codes so we don't need to really worry about the stack up of randomization and I'll, i mean i'll keep looking at it just to make sure that we're not doing anything silly and I ask around um you know, and get a good review, but I think we're set in terms of ch of making updates for the uplink uh, protocol. So we should should be in good shape there. Okay. Hey, James, you have the floor. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, not too much to report, especially compared to the fantastic reports we've seen we've received in regards to the rest of the meeting today. Um, <clears throat> pardon. We've been completing more infrastructure work. We've been slightly delayed in the temporary deployment of the equipment as we've focused more of our efforts on the outbuildings out here at the Remote Lab South compound, I guess. Uh, but we're continuing more work and uh, we're, things have sped up a lot in regards to our outbuildings ever since we got our newest pieces of equipment, which has been nice. And we've been organizing more of the remote lab gear that we have here and getting it ready for both its temporary deployment and its permanent deployment in the outbuildings. So exciting things. Awesome. Yeah, no, it's good stuff. If you have any photographs of exciting equipment moving Earth and <laughs> and making stuff happen, then we'd love to see it. I'll see about getting those posted. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, our next newsletter will be April 1st. Uh, so if you have any any news or photographs, that'd be a good good place to put them. And uh, and we really really love April Fool's Day. So if anybody has some good technical shenanigans to put into the newsletter, then then please uh, send them our way, and we'll uh, we'll get them in there. I'll see about getting those sent. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. All right, and we will have a an event in uh, for essentially remote lab self will be will be the the central focus and leading um, a pretty big event in September. Uh, so I'm mentioning it because September will get here before we know it, and it's the IEEE iWork or IWRC conference. This will be in Little Rock, Arkansas, and we'll focus on Chips Act money to underserved states such as Arkansas. We're hoping that Remote Lab South, since it's in outside of Little Rock, will be able to benefit 
and at the very least, we would like to contribute to uh, promoting the open source and research and development work that actually does go on in the state. Uh, really looking forward to that. We've gotten a lot of the we've gotten the logistics taken care of for the out of towners coming in, so we have a place to stay, and we are uh, pretty much ready to to start working with the organizers. Um, the The conference is starting to show up on the the websites and all the the trackers for IEEE conferences, um, and we have at least one new volunteer because of it. Uh, somebody that I know from. Uh, from from Little Rock that is extremely interested in supporting the effort. So that's that's coming up. That'll be after after DefCon. Um, some we've done some work uh, this over the past week to to make our DefCon um, open source radio showcase uh, happen. So everything is working working pretty well uh, for the, for that big show. Um, you know, so no snags and additional. Uh, information. And we also have another opportunity to show off our work uh, at the uh, International Microwave Society uh, of 2023, which will be June in San Diego. Um, and so there's space that we can use in order to do any sort of demos that we would like to kind of spread the word for, for open source digital radio um, that benefits uh, amateur radio along with a lot of other services. So been spending some time trying to, to get all of that working. Okay, that's that's pretty much all I've got. Um, does anybody need anything? Is there any? I know that Remote Lab South needs money, and I've got that on the docket for for our board of directors to look at. Shouldn't be a shouldn't be any trouble. But does anybody need anything outside of that? Any resources or stuff or or help or roadblocks? I mean, besides time, I think we probably all need more of that. Can you arrange that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good try. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. If if there is anything that anybody needs in terms of resources or assistance or support or information or anything like that, let me know. I'll do the dead level best that I can to get it done. Um, yeah, I think we're we're good. Did I talk about this picture uh, last time? I forget. I think it that picture happened between our last meeting and today. So why don't you go ahead and tell everybody about it? <laughs> okay. And this is a little, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit of hardware progress on using the Pluto to transmit. Uh, the standard demo, the hello world for this sort of a radio is, is just a tone or two tones or something like that. But I wanted to demonstrate that I could actually feed a continuous set of generated samples into it. So I came up with this uh, slightly more sophisticated hello world where I'm sweeping a tone sinusoidally. The red uh, <clears throat> red trace is the primary signal, obviously. And uh, the lighter colored traces are, are spurious. The one down the middle is the le local oscillator leakage. And... Uh, the mirror image of the desired signal is obviously uh, just exactly that. It's down about 35 dB, which I think matches the, uh, the quantization error of the 12 dB or 12 bit uh, DAX. I'm not sure where the three times uh, image comes from. That's the, the much fainter sweep that goes out almost to the edge of the screen. This, by the way, is a real time feed from the spectrum analyzer in the remote lab using the newer uh, way of viewing the spectrum analyzer remotely that I cobbled together where it's uh, video is being encoded on a separate Raspberry Pi in the remote lab. And you can subscribe to it and, and view it with a, a simple video stream viewer. And this picture is, uh, has been playing on my screen almost continuously for, uh, for a week or so now. And it's quite hypnotic. And it seems to be quite reliable. I don't see it glitching or dropping frames or anything. And this waveform is sort of designed to make such a problem become visible. Yeah, it's cool. Maybe maybe we should have this as a, maybe on the website, like a 
I know that it's in the repo, like this instructions on how can you log into our spectrum analyzer. Like I know that that exists, but is there is there some way to that wouldn't be um, wouldn't overload it to have it show up on the website or have somebody click through and and get this feed? Um, I can look into that. I don't think we want to do it continuously, but uh, on demand which should be possible. Just a matter of cobbling together the right links and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I can't think of anybody else that has an on-demand networked spectrum analyzer out there. So it'd be it'd be pretty trick to to do it and then and then say, okay, if you have this equipment, here's how you here's how you get this done. That'd be pretty cool. That's pretty neat. That also reminds me that that uh, we ha also have something else working in remote labs, and that's Maya. That's right. We did show that last time. Pretty sure. If not, I could show it right now, I think. Um, yeah, have we done anything in uh oh okay. Yeah, but that's uh that's a pretty powerful bit of code that uh looks looks good and um fully fully utilizes the Pluto's FPGA. It's really nice to see projects like that. And as we found out, the um Maya was done by using the uh, Amaranth framework, which is a way to go uh, in a Python-centric way to go from Python code to HDL. And uh, Dr. Estefes used this to uh, program Maya. Um, so you use the Amaranth framework. And so I, I asked him if he would be willing to uh, be the a guest editorialist for the April newsletter. And he said, yes. So. So he's slated to write an article about how to use Amaranth open source uh, framework uh, and how how he, how it went, sort of ex his experiences with using Amaranth to produce his uh, his project Maya. So I'm looking forward to that and being able to uh, to put that in the newsletter and spread the word. I, what I've not tried to do is run Maya and this demo on the same. At the same time, <laughs> it's a spectrum analyzer too, so we should be able to do this. Oh, um, that's cool. Yeah, it might <laughs> it might look this, totally different. This architecture is is more conservative of bits on the network. So if you're going to do it over the network, you'd want to use it this way because it's going over is compressed video. Yeah, maybe a compare and contrast for the newsletter would be good. Cool. Okay. Well, I will shut down the recording at this point and see you all next week. And then if anybody would like to stay on for, uh, for office hours for a bit, I've got some time here and uh, would love to, to talk more with everybody.